Evgenia Alberts, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me. Um, so these are dark days in the world, but also dark days in, in Russia. Can you describe to us what the last few weeks have been like within Russia? You know, it is partially a personal story. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, you would ask me, you know, how can I introduce you? And I would tell you, Yasha, I am editor-in-chief of the digital-only political, uh, political website, The New Times. I am talk show host at the Free Wheeling Echo Must Be Broadcasting. I have, you know, uh, each Monday, I have my show. It's very popular. I have one million, you know, listeners each Monday, and it goes under uh, after my name. So uh, I'm fine with this. On top of that, each Tuesday, I run my YouTube channel and I'm making money out of my YouTube channel. I'm doing all kind of, you know, political stuff there. I'm a pol political animal and all things political. That's what I love. That's why I, um, I subscribe uh, to your podcast and I listen, you know, to you and I listen to, uh, to other political podcasts. However, uh, so February 24th, that was when uh, Putin started the war against neighboring Ukraine. And so two days later, we, uh, uh, we were told by the Russian Minister of Truth, that's how we call it, you know, there is, you know, the agency that oversee, you know, communications and tells, uh, and uh, um, tells what kind of words we can use and we cannot. But apparently we were told that we cannot say war, invasion, and offense with respect to the events in Ukraine. We can say it is a special operation of Russian troops to demilitarize and denazify Ukraine. So because of course we said that this is a war and that Russian federal troops invaded Ukraine from three sides, the New Times was blocked two days into the war. And now one can read whatever we do only through VPN. I don't know whether your listeners are aware about virtual private network. You know, this they can be, uh, they can be free. They can be, you know, if you have to have a good one, uh, you have to pay for it. But that what allows you to pretend as if you know you are sitting in Moscow, but in fact, you know, but uh, for the internet for the purpose, uh, you, for instance, in London, in New York, or God knows where in Sweden. So those who use, and a lot of our readers, they know how to use VPN. So we work for those who are capable to do this. Okay, I said, not nice, but of course, you know, everything compared to what is happening in Ukraine is just, you know, just peanuts. So on Monday, I had my show at Ech Um And uh, I, I had a, a a reporter from Kiev who was reporting about what was going on in Kiev, and I had a military uh, analyst, and I had uh, a political scientist. So everything was uh, was okay. I did my show. Uh, it was it uh, it was pretty uh, well uh, accepted. Apparently, it turned out it was my last show because uh, the following Thursday. Uh, Moscow were cut off the air. With, you know, we found ourselves in a pure Orwellian world. Like in 1984, you know, lies are tr truth, peace is war, and that's exactly how we're, suppo who we're supposed to operate in this country. And along with Echo Moscow, another 16 different independent uh, media, whether uh, an internet based uh, TV channel, uh, TV Rain, or a, 
um, original, pretty good original paper snack, which comes out, you know, in Oral Mountains. Uh, it shut down itself, you know, some publications uh, just decided to stop uh, uh, putting their stuff out of the fear that they were going to get arrested, others were shut down. And it, as if that was not enough, on uh, last Friday, Russian State Duma, it is a body of yes men who pretend that they are parliament. It's just, you know, like, you know, Reichstag and times of Hitler. Or bef before, of course, you know, Hitler dissolved the uh, Reichstag. So uh, they passed three repressive laws in accordance with which you can get uh, 15 years in jail for what they call, for publishing what they call fake news. What is it, fake news? Any information about uh, the special operation in Ukraine. Uh, other than from the Minister of Defense of the Russian Federation uh, is considered fake news. If you call for sanctions against Russian Federation, you say, you know, that sanctions should be imposed because Russia is an aggressor, you can get five years in jail. There is another uh, law that says, uh, that speaks uh, law, uh, against discreditation of the Russian army. It used to say, if you say that uh, Russian uh, missiles destroyed the center of Kharkiv and uh, civilian buildings and civilians got killed, that discreditation of the Russian army. Uh, when these laws were uh, passed and then President Putin signed it into law the next day. Then almost the entire, you know, almost all reporters and editors and political scientists and economists, they ran uh, to the airports and left the country. There are so, you know, so very few of us left here. It's even scary because you call somebody and, uh, and you know, this is a you know, guy who covered, you know, second war in Chechnya and, you know, and or did a very good, you know, glossy magazine. And he tells you, Zhenya, but listen, I'm not a Russian. Ah, okay. And then you call for an expert, the political economist, a great guy, you know, who's professor at the university here and also professor in of an American university. And he tells him, no, I'm in Istanbul. And so, and of course, you know, uh, Americans, they probably, you know, don't know that uh, after the uh, 1917 revolution, a lot of intellectuals found themselves in Constantinople, right? It's also Turkey, as Istanbul is Turkey. And uh, there is a joke that there is a repetition of uh, what happened back in 1917. I wouldn't go that far, but it's true that Istanbul is stuffed with Russian intellectuals and reporters and editors and artists and filmmakers uh, and uh, you know talk show hosts and tv personalities uh, and so and they're there or you can find them some you know with people with a little bit uh, bigger bug they go to uh, they take a lal and fly to tel aviv okay business people they fly to dubai and abu dhabi um, it's not, you know, prices went significantly up. The entire Europe closed for us. And uh, beginning yesterday, all Russian airlines stopped uh, doing international flights because the majority of their um, planes are in, uh, are, take, uh, are in leasing. And so leasing companies already uh, called uh, those planes back. So. So they no longer fly. So one of my reporters, uh, a young kid, she wrote to me, uh, she's from St. Petersburg. 
And she wrote to me that, you know, Evgenia Markovna, I'm urgently getting married, that question. I'm urgently getting married because I don't want to go in exile alone, you know? So, and I want a guy to be my, uh, you know, official husband. So, but, so they didn't have enough money to fly to Astana, that's the capital of Kazakhstan. Therefore, they decided to fly to Uzbekistan. That's almost the border with Afghanistan, that's the Central Asia, because they don't have enough money to fly to Istanbul. Now, some people went to Tbilisi, the capital of Georgia, and you probably remember that Putin invaded uh, Georgia in 2008, shortly after Bucharest meeting, where uh, Georgia and Ukraine, when Bush said that Georgia and Ukraine shortly will get the roadmap to NATO. So immediately, you know, there was a, an accident, border accident uh, between Georgia and um, South Ossetia anyway, and Putin conducted his uh, uh, quick operation in Georgia. So to cut the long story short, now uh, Tbilisi is afraid to allow Russian dissidents and Russian escapees to get into Georgia because they're under severe pressure from the side of the Russian government. <laughs> and so some very good journalists who flew to Baku, that's Azerbaijan, and they flew to uh, Tbilisi, they were not allowed in. So they had to turn back and now trying to get to Europe. So to cut the long story short, Yasha, it is, I feel myself, it's very ambiguous because on the one hand, I feel awful about, I'm a Russian citizen. I'm citizen of the Russian Federation. And I always thought that being a political journalist, I have to have the same sort of, you know, constraints in the same settings as people I write for. I can, probably I could have applied for Israeli citizens because I'm Jewish or you know Spanish or Portuguese because my centuries ago my ancestors uh, went from Morocco to uh, and they were kicked out from Spain and Portugal I never it never even occurred to me to do that I thought that you know I just have to be a Russian citizen as readers for whom I write but apparently it is a shame now, you know? I feel so ashamed that my country, which went through the awful realities of the World War II, who my country, which lost 27 million people to Nazi occupation and the, the, the war, my dad, my dad fought at the front of the World War II. And you know where? In Nikolaev, Yasha. It is like a joke of history. My dad was parachuted on the territory of the Nazi occupied Ukraine. Uh, uh, of course, you know, he was Jewish, but by his legend, he was uh, Georgian, Grigory Basile. His uh, real name was Mark Elbots, Grigory Basile. And his safe house where he had his radio transmitter, some other stuff, as far as it's stuff. It was in the city of Nikolaev. It's Nikolaev in Ukraine, Nikolaev. It's the same city which is under attack as we speak. So, Back then, in 1941, Nikolai was occupied by Romanian troops who were allies to Nazi Germany, and my dad was fighting uh, Germans, right, who, who were uh, at war with the Soviet Union. Now, you just think about this. German government provided Ukrainians with the anti-tank missiles in order to fight Russian tanks. And they do this exactly in Nikolai. And this twist of history 
it's just unbelievable. And I'm I feel I I feel angry and ashamed of what my country did. And at the same time, you know, I, I'm I'm constantly watch whatever I can find on the internet because of course Russian propaganda machine doesn't show anything. And I see all these awful uh, scenes of destroyed Kharkiv and Vinitsa, which is destroyed. And my people were from Shtatel, not far from Vinitsa, Dirashnya. Uh, and Zhitomir is destroyed, the center of this destroyed, and Nikolaev is under attack. And now, you know, uh, they're moving towards Odessa. And it's just impossible even to think because I traveled so many times around Ukraine. I know it, I love it. You know, I always felt very secure there. So, and of course, you know, you just think about this, Yasha. People there speak the same language I speak. 95% of, of people who, who resided in Kharkiv, before, before the recent events, they are Russian speakers, 95%. Kharkiv is destroyed. The center of Kharkiv is totally destroyed. You know, it's just, wow. Um, look, thank you for, for your courage and for your vivid description of, of, of what's going on. I think one of the things that people who live in democracies often have trouble understanding is the differences between different gradations of dictatorship, between different gradations of authoritarian regimes, the difference even between a sort of classic dictatorship and a totalitarian regime. Um, you know, in 2015, Russia was already a dictatorship, but um, as you're describing, there are certain freedoms that people had. There was your ability to broadcast and so on. Um, tell us a little bit about sort of how uh, that change of life is, is taking place. What it felt like to live under Putin four or five years ago and what it might look like at the end of this war. Um, and I guess one of the questions that I'm asking myself is the extent to which what we're seeing is a shift from a dictatorship to a totalitarian regime. Is that what we're in the middle of or not? Um, and, and, and to tell us about that transformation, not just from the 90s to five years ago, but, but from five years ago to today. You know, since uh, I've been teaching so many times courses on regimes and predominantly on authoritarian regimes, uh, I should say that totalitarian regimes, uh, they were frequent in the 20th century and they, uh, they are pretty easy uh, to describe. These are total regimes. That the, the regimes, uh, one party system regimes, where uh, uh, bureaucrats control all spheres of the society, everything economic, economy, ideology, uh, judiciary private life, public, public life really do, uh, doesn't uh, exist. So it is, you know, the state, it's just one big state which takes over uh, everything. Civil society doesn't exist. That's what to totalitarian uh, regime. In total regimes, uh, the uh, party serves as a form of government. It was true for Nazi Germany with the Nazi party. It was true uh, for the Soviet Union with the communist part of the Soviet Union, which was the form of governance. Of course, it wasn't a party. It was a vertical structure uh, that uh, controlled uh, this vast country of 30 million, uh, 300 million people. Uh, it is true for the current China. Uh, it is true for the current North uh, so, uh, North Korea with its Chuchia party. It's not communist party, it's a different type of, but it doesn't matter. You know, these are not really parties. Also, what's important to understand that the regimes, they are built on ideology. 
in the Soviet Union, of course, that was the ideology of the communist state of, you know, of, uh, uh, or, you know, the, there was this idea that uh, regular ordinary uh, folks, they control uh, the state. Of course, they didn't. But it was, you know, this kind of idea that was extremely attractive, and that's what allowed Soviet Union to uh, to attract and and to control the half of the world that United States didn't during the Cold War. Now, when it comes to authoritarian regimes, the most important part of the, of the authoritarian regime is that they usually don't bear any ideology. Putin doesn't have ideology of his people. They are portuguese. They can be Democrats yesterday. They can turn into imperial nationalists today. They can become fascists tomorrow. And in fact, you know, the kind of the, kind of the regime that exists in the contemporary Russia, it's a pure corporate regime. The way Benito Mussolini described it you know, back in the early 1920s. Uh, everything inside the state, no one against the state, no one outside the state. So there is a corporate state which uh, is comprised out of the graduates of the Soviet Union, Union's most repressive institution, the KGB. And, you know, their institutional culture and their organizational culture is built on violence. However, by the way, unlike in the total states where violence is an instrument of control and also of rule, authoritarian regimes tend to avoid whole scale repressions. Everything can happen. Of course, you know, you remember that in Uruguay, uh, during the, when military junta uh, was running the country for a decade or so, uh, you know, they had, you know, I believe every 50th uh, Uruguayan was in jail. So, um, but usually as certain regimes, you know, they can be harsh, they can be uh, mild. Uh, Russian authoritarianism is extremely corrupted. It's just ostensibly corrupt. You look what's happening in Ukraine. You know, Putin invested billions and billions in the army during the last years when there were all these there were all these windfall profits that were coming out of you know uh, huge oil prices. So they assumed, as far as we understand, they were going to to take control over the capital of Ukraine, Kiev, in three days. And we see uh, now uh, teachers from Ukraine. We see that they that apparently Russian troops have problems with logistics. They have problems with uh, delivering gas. They have problems with rotation. Anyway, uh, and it, I would you know already you know I spoke to some uh, analysts and asked you know how could it be that why do they why it's so bad? And the answer is because, you know, billions of dollars were stolen. Because each and every general or each and every, you know, member of the Putin's closest entourage has, you know, an immense villas, immense yachts, and not just one, but several. These are people, unlike, by the way, Soviets, who, whose life was based on making money inside Russia, but spending this money outside Russia in the luxuries of Europe and the United States. So, so yeah, sorry. Yeah, so, so, I'm, so this is really helpful to me in thinking what Russia today isn't. Um, I think I still struggle to describe what it is. So, you know, it doesn't seem to be you have a sort of soft dictatorship in some countries in which you can't criticize the government directly in too extreme a way or in too popular format. State television is basically under control of 
the state um, and emits propaganda. There's a pretense of elections, but they're not truly free and fair, and so everybody knows who the winner is going to be. But you can have uh, opposition spaces where people express their opinion to some extent. You can have a small intellectual magazine with critiques of a government nobody particularly cares about. I mean, you can certainly go about your life um, you know, as an ordinary citizen saying, I don't care about politics um, and pretty much do what you want and, and, and be left alone. So that's on one sort of side. Um, it seems to me that Russia is no longer that because they are closing down your uh, YouTube channel and, 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 and your show because there is now a demand for proactive forms of agreement with, with the government um, uh, because of the much more extreme pressure uh, uh, on uh, on ordinary citizens that seems to be taking place in the last few weeks at least, right? On the other hand, we have this model of a totalitarian regime where you have to be in active agreement with the government, where you have to prove your loyalty in a proactive way, where there's no such thing as an apolitical choral society or an apolitical chess club. Um, they all have to be active subsidiaries of the regime and it's all subsumed to an overarching ideology as was the case in the Soviet Union, as was the case in, in the Third Reich. But you're saying Russia isn't exactly becoming that because it doesn't have enough of an ideology for that. It's Russia? not the right model. Not enough. It so, doesn't so, have how, for how to, so how to understand what Russia is or will be in the next few months? Where does it fall on the scale? Or you said perhaps corporatism. Like, like how should you think about the nature of a political system that's coalescing today in Russia? I, okay, I will say directly, uh, corporate state, that's fascio, that what we call fascism, fascio. Yes, it is, uh, it's, it's definitely not Nazi Germany because it's not based on these, you know, on the uh, idea of destruction of, you know, of, uh, uh, of one, uh, religion totally and killing all uh, Jews and all Roma and, you know, and all people who don't fit to be, uh, you know, proper Aryans. Uh, but, you know, I would say that we are, if, if, if to look for the com comparison, I would say uh, Franco, Spain, Spain under Franco. Uh, and I would say uh, I would say Portugal under Salazar. I would say that that's the uh, the closest uh, models. Uh, but keep in mind, Yasha, that until two weeks ago, my broadcasting Echo Moscow did exist. There were four of us liberal voices, but we were uh, out there. And no one could tell me, Evgenia, please don't say this. Just no way. That was the rule of the game, that we could say whatever we considered right to do. Uh, no one could tell me what to publish in the New Times. However, there were other publications and, you know, pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good newspapers who were allowed uh, to talk about corruption and who could publish stories about, you know, uh, Chechen dictator, a madman Kadyrov, but, the rule, but they were not allowed to say anything bad about Putin, FSB, his Czechists, you know, and his closest entourage. So in that way, I mean, of course, you know, uh, it, it, in the situation in Russia politically, was gradually was getting from bad to worse. And the reason why so many people immigrated uh, last Friday was precisely that the kind of laws that were passed, this military censorship, it made impossible for the absolute majority of the outlets to cover the war as, as, as it should be covered. Now, when I come out on my um, website, on my YouTube channel, I say, I cannot say war, 
I say special operation, or I say military conflict, or you know, military. I cannot say about atrocities uh, which uh, Russian troops do commit in Ukraine. For that, I will have to leave the country. Most likely, I will have to do it because you go, <laughs> you speak, and you constantly tell yourself you cannot say this, you cannot say this. Not because they are going to close you. It's no longer the question of your existence as a publication. It's the question of your personal freedom. Um, what do you think is the view of most Russians on the war? Is the uh, propaganda from the state so effective and the blackout of independent media so effective that most Russians uh, believe the Kremlin's version of events? Or do you think that there is a, a widespread recognition of the nature of this war and perhaps even widespread opposition to it? Uh, of course, you know, it's a $64,000 question because you would ask yourself, what was the point for Putin and his people to close all the independent media? If Putin is so popular, if his uh, propaganda machine is so effective, if uh, two thirds of the of, uh, population support the war as state uh, owned pollsters uh, claim, then why was, you know, create yourself so, so many problems by closing down everything? After all, you know, my, I thought, you know, wait a second, you guys yourself in Kremlin, you need to listen to some to something, to hear something, to know. Like you know, in the Soviet Union, they had this problem. This is what we call information asymmetry, right? So uh, there are no in the in the in in the strict authoritarian regimes, Paul's sociology doesn't really exist because people are afraid to say what they really think. I will give you an example. Yasha, I have a twin, right? You know, so we grew up in the same uh, family. We're very close and so on. If a pollster calls me and say, uh, and ask me, if elections are going to be to next Sunday, who are you going to vote for? I say Navalny. Of course, you know, he's my friend, Alexei Navalny. My twin, who is pretty much the same uh, uh, of the same ideas as I am, she would say Putin. Why? Because she's afraid. And that's what that's why it's very, it's impossible really to talk about uh, the public opinion in the in this type of regime. Now, there is just one post left, Levada Center, which is an independent, for, which was pronounced the foreign agent in which is not allowed to conduct polls during the elections or during the, you know, the, the kind of you know, situation like now. But right after the beginning of the war, they conducted a brief poll. Of course, you know, it's telephone-based polls, so God knows you know, what kind of sample they have and how random is the sample. But anyway, say, you know, they did, uh, they try to do their best. So their outcome was that about 45% were in favor of the war and 40% against. I would, I think my, uh, my guts tell me that most likely and judging by the vindictivity of Kremlin with respect to media who were immediately opposed to the war, the liberal media, I think that probably most likely 50-50. In fact, when uh, during the when Putin invaded Georgia back in 2008, when there was this uh, uh, war um, against Georgia, uh, Russian liberal media won the information war. It was commonly accepted that you know that we managed to tell the real story to the Russian public. So, and Putin did, he, if, he's, if he's good in anything, he's very good in, in learning uh, uh, lessons. So that's why I don't believe that two thirds of Russians as state pollsters, and there are just two of them, 
claim. And by the way, they give about the same numbers, just statistically impossible. The two different pulses come with, you know, the same numbers, just impossible. So, so the two different state owned pulses came up with, with exactly the same figure. Yeah. Yeah, um, I love it. I love it. I like this kind of uh, pulse. So that's what I think. But, you know, I don't know. I, I have, I'm thinking about, you know, Unfortunately, you know, I had a knee replacement surgery, and that's why you know it's a little bit difficult for me to move around. But I, I I'm thinking about getting into my car and going places and ask people questions. That would be fascinating. Um, uh, a lot of Putin's appeal to ordinary Russians, such as it is, was based on the contrast between the economic chaos and the suffering of the 1990s and the relative affluence that Russia has achieved since then. Um, the sanctions that are now in place on Russia uh, will obviously have a deep and immediate effect on, on the affluence of Russia. Um, some estimates assume that uh, the country will lose up to half of its GDP in, 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 in a matter of months. Um, what effect do you think that is going to have on Putin's popularity, but also on the stability of his regime? Yes, you know this very well, that uh, this type of uh, regimes, uh, they're affected not by the popular uprisings, because usually popular uprisings uh, do not happen or even if they happen, they are suppressed with repressions. That's exactly what we see, you know, Russians go on the streets in, in 50 plus cities across the country against the war on a daily basis, or uh, almost 15,000 people already arrested uh, and put in jail and some for 15 or 30 days in jail for the, for the anti-war protest. And uh, anti-war, the whole, the, even the wording is forbidden now because that's the you know uh, that that's uh, what goes for discreditation of the uh, Russian uh, military. So uh, the question I think is uh, when the split of the elites is going to happen, and just think about this. Um, as I as I said earlier. Uh, in uh, you know elites in, in, in Russia, they got accustomed to make their profits uh, in Russia out of oil, uh, out of you know oil and gas rent. Of course, you know it's a rental oriented economy. Uh, out of bribes and these bribes are anonymous. Uh, so all of a sudden, just out of the blue skies. They lost their possibility to, to live in Europe. They got accustomed, as I said, to make money inside Russia, but many of them live in Europe or they have their villas in Italy and on the French Riviera. They have their kids studying in the Western universities or in the boarding schools in Switzerland, uh, Great Britain, and some in the United States. And now all this nice life came to an end. On top of that, they lost billions. In accordance to uh, some estimate, uh, Russian billionaires collectively lost $34 billion. It's an estimate, and that's the very beginning. It's just the beginning. However, it's not just about billionaires. It's about the upper middle class Putin's main, by the way, you know, support group, you know, his main constituency, his own, you know, uh, FSB, you know, these checkers, you know, secret police people, uh, Siloviki, army, et cetera, who also became very rich during these, uh, you know, uh, uh, years of high oil prices. And these guys got a custom because, because you know, they robbed uh, businesses on a daily basis. They created millions and they invested those millions in different offshores in the different blue chips in your country, by the way, too. And all of a sudden, 
they lost their access to their uh, money savings and to their investments and crypto exchanges closed and uh, accounts closed and they no longer can um, uh, transfer more than uh, $10,000 uh, a month from the Moscow-based account to the foreign account, and they don't have access to their offshores, and Russian blue chips, you know, became paper, just, you know, worth, you know, uh, less than a paper. And we're talking about thousands and thousands and thousands of people in their late 30s, early 40s. They got a custom to go to Dubai and to Abu Dhabi once in two months, or many of them, they even have their, you know, their property there. They got accustomed to go skiing in Russian Sochi in a very, you know, it's very, very expensive ski resort. They got accustomed to get to Riviera whenever uh, they can. And now all this life went down the toilet. So I think, I think that uh, regime is getting uh, to be very unstable. Yes, of course, the other side of instability is in, uh, will be re increased repressions, obviously because you know uh, they understand what's going to happen as well as I do. Or at least, you know, uh, there are political scientists like Fyodor Lukyanov who is going to tell them uh, what's going to happen and what they should be afraid of. So, so but you know, I wouldn't expect really, yes, you know, there, there are already 17 million Russians that live below the poverty line. And of course, you know, uh, 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 Russian ruble, uh, the devaluation of the Russian ruble is about 40% already, it will go worse. And a lot of people, you know, will become very poor and those who are uh, more or less okay now will become poor and those who are poor, they will become beggars. It's, it's all true. Uh, however, the ability, you know, there are, uh, of the repressive apparatus to suppress any um, dissent is, is pretty good, they're pretty effective. Uh, and most important is that when you have this um, state propaganda machine, uh, it creates a very specific sort of, you know, it's different, uh, it's difficult uh, for people to, to create association with each other. That's exactly what Soviets did. So that people in uh, Kursk say, uh, they would realize that their life as bad as those in Tver, and not because you know their local guys are so bad, but because the guy who is sitting in Kremlin, uh, you know, put uh, their savings in their and their uh, life uh, into the war uh, in Ukraine. But when we're talking about splits in the elite, which you're absolutely right, often are the beginnings of a downfall of authoritarian regimes. Um, I've been thinking for the last few days about an interesting divergence between the life of Vladimir Putin and the lives of the people around him. Uh, you know, Putin has uh, a lot of corrupt wealth that he, I'm sure, has parked in various vehicles and probably including in the West. But his life isn't immediately changing. He hasn't been traveling out of Russia uh, very much. He continues to live in the Kremlin. He continues to be at the head of a state apparatus, um, even though he may on paper have lost some of his wealth. Um, his day-to-day -day, uh, experience is the same now as it would have been a month or so ago. Whereas for the most powerful players around him, uh, life has changed quickly and drastically in the ways you talk about. And I wonder whether that's one of the ways in which he might start to misunderstand, miscalculate the, the interests and the um, uh, experience of, of the people in his closest circle. But I guess that raises the question of what a split in the regime would look like. What kind of form would it take 
Um, and is there any hope to be had from it? Do you think that if there is some kind of uh, split between different factions of a regime, there's any hope that that can lead to an improvement in the overall situation or to an accidental democratization? Or would it at best result in uh, the substitution of one figurehead with another figurehead um, uh, while you know, the system of repression and, and deep corruption continues? I wish I could read the crystal ball. I'm not good at that at all. Um, we can, we know how the regime changed in countries like Brazil, Argentina, you know, in Latin American countries with a similar type of regimes. And we know that in some countries, uh, they went from one, uh, military junta to another, like in Brazil, an ongoing coup d'etat, or like in Bolivia, it became, you know, former, you know, national sporting event. Each year there was a coup, right? Um, but, you know, we also know the example of Uruguay, when junta, military junta was in power for 10, 10 plus years, they changed constitution, I believe, seven times, and however, and you know, and then it just came to an end. And Uruguay got back to more or less democratic governance. So we know Argentina between two perons, you know, there were, you know, this awful 10 years when 20,000 young people disappeared, but then, you know, gradually uh, through, you know, different economic crisis, but, you know, Argentina managed somehow to get on a more uh, on a more democratic way of governance. So, you know, I, I really don't want to make predictions. I can tell you one thing, just keep in mind that uh, these last 30 years since the collapse of the Soviet Union, they were not in, way, in vain. And uh, those people who are in power now, they have children who are, and the Russia is run by billionaires not by millionaires, by billionaires. And these billionaires, they have children who got accustomed to be children of billionaires. And these children of billionaires, they went to boarding schools in the States or in uh, Switzerland or in the United Kingdom. And then they went to different good universities. And what's more important, they don't want to live in the golden cage, but you know, uh, our guys at the top of, uh, uh, of uh, the power structure, they're already old enough. They have grandchildren. And those grandchildren, they just don't understand what, you know, their grandpa uh, is doing right now, you know, because they just, they probably never lived in Russia or they just used to come to see daddy or, you know, grandpa uh, for Russian Christmas. So if you remember Yasha, uh, Stalin's daughter, uh, uh, Svetlana Leluyeva, did her best to escape and lived in the United States. Uh, both Khrushchev's uh, children lived in the United States. His, you know, uh, niece uh, uh, lives in New York City right now. Uh, Gorbachev's daughter uh, lives uh, outside Russia, and his grandchildren live outside, and they've never been in the last five years, and that's what Gorbachev told me myself, himself, I'm sorry. Brezhnev's uh, grandchildren, child, lives in the United States. Yeltsin's children, Yeltsin's daughter, and uh, Yeltsin's uh, grandchildren, they live outside Russia. It is to say that Russian elite talking about great patriotism, extremely unpatriotic. They love this country to death, but to our death, not to their death. They prefer to enjoy, to love Russia from afar. And I don't believe that they are prepared to lock themselves inside 
Putin's uh, Kremlin or inside Putin's Moscow without possibility to fly to Spain just because there is some nice exhibition coming out, you know, or, you know, without the possibility uh, to spend some time on Riviera because they like this film festival, or because some of them just enjoy Monaco and Cassini in Monaco because Russian aristocracy in the Tsarist times used to come to Monaco to spend uh, whatever proceed they got from the peasants. So to cut the long story short, no, I don't believe that these government of billionaires with their families of uh, wives and, uh, you know, who go, no longer they have Prada in Moscow. Prada walked away. How can you live without in the city that doesn't have Prada? All of them, all these luxury stores, they just walked away. Yasha, there are certain things that don't happen. Wives of Russian billionaires, they cannot live without Chanel, Prada, Louis Vuitton, and you name it. No, they're going to torture their husbands, but they will make them to bring all this luxury, glossy life that existed in Moscow before recent events back. That's amazing. That I've, I've, the, I've, the I've never people. thought of, um, uh, you know, Prada and Chanel leaving Moscow as the most effective uh, weapon against the regime. But, um, but, but so just to broaden it out, what, what do you hope for from governments in the West? And what do you hope for from, from me or from listeners to this podcast? Um, what should we do and what shouldn't we do? Um, to maximize the chances, slim as they might be, uh, that Russians will once again be able to, to live in a free country? I would say that the most important thing now is to help ordinary Ukrainians. These are people, they suffer. Uh, and I think that it is, it is just, human to help them. I like what, you know, some people rent their apartments without any intention of living there, but just to, to help people who had to leave uh, their places. Two million refugees, two million Ukrainian refugees. By the way, look at the numbers. Putin says that he came to Ukraine, in order to defend Russian speakers in Ukraine, right? Because, you know, uh, Russian speakers in, in the East, they're suffering under the, from the Ukrainian nationalism. Now, I said 2 million refugees from Ukraine. Of that, 53,000 went to Russia. 53,000 went to Russia. Uh, so what is it? It is uh, less than uh, 5%, right? And all others went to Europe. So once again, I think that uh, it's eminent that the West, uh, the collective West, uh, helps Ukraine to sustain its uh, statehood. Evgeny Albats. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah.